Well, normally I, I talk to film students uh, and uh, the average age is distinctly lower. Uh, <laughs> but it's okay, I'm, I'm, I'm adaptable. Uh, and uh, normally I, I simply try to pass on the wealth of knowledge and information I have learned from the, one of the greatest teachers one could have over 30 years. I started with Kubrick on Napoleon, uh, thinking maybe, oh, work with him for one year. Uh, uh, well, it, it turned out very differently. Uh, Napoleon was pulled by MGM. It was, didn't happen. And uh, then the next thing in 1970, uh, he was very much in love with a, with a novel called Dream Novel by Arthur Schnitzler, a Viennese uh, writer uh, called by Sigmund Freud his alter ego. And, and all right, so I read it too. And great, great, great. So the first contract with Warner Brothers, fully signed and sealed. And then Stanley Kubrick pulled out because it was too difficult. It was a, a story about uh, yeah, sexual fantasy and jealousy. In other words, something where everybody in the audience is an expert. And uh, so he, 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 he left this and we did Clockwork Orange. That was a um, uh, my first experience, but that was much easier. It's a book written in the first person, and you can see here in the exhibit uh, certain elements of it. It was a, what we call today a cut and paste job to turn this novel into uh, a film script. And then um, I, I adapted what I had learned before, which has to do with data processing and planning and negotiating, to the manufacture of a film and uh, you know, people always say I worked uh, with Stanley Kubrick for 30 years. Not true. I worked for Stanley Kubrick for 30 years. It's a very clear <laughs> distinction. I had, I had my role and I loved it. I was not at all responsible for what you see on the screen, only for uh, things and rights and what you get and what you need. Right. Now, talk, I was very lucky that I then, after his death, actually I was 65, uh, developed a new profession. I grew into this over a few years, and that's what I'm doing now, working at film schools. And this, the great joy of that is that I'm meeting young people who are far more <laughs> clever and more intelligent than I am, and it's a tremendous privilege. I, I meet lots of young talent, and uh, I try to help them. I just have more experience. I just help them, and, and it, it's really wonderful. I work a lot in London and in Denmark and Germany. I even was in, in, in Miami once and in, in South America and whatever, so it, I, I do that. I also support this exhibition. This is now the 15th engagement. The last one was in Seoul, Korea. The next one will be Mexico City, and then Hong Kong, and um, so I do that, and I work with Tushin publishers on, on various books. We have another one coming out maybe in a year or so on Dr. Strangelove, the one on 2001, beautiful book. You can see that in the bookshop downstairs, just came out, and, and, and so, so. I'm, and I have seven grandchildren. I mean, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm really busy. I'm busy, and I, I like it, and... Uh, yeah, and, and one day when life is over, I hope I'm, I'm getting out here in the middle of being extremely busy. <laughs> so, so now that's it. Now let's talk about Stanley Kubrick and filmmaking. Um, uh, a key part, and I learned this very early on. I learned this when I lived in New York. I was, a, by the way, a landed immigrant with a green card as a, as a young man in New York. He then came back. Uh, uh, with Dr. Strangelove and his three children and his family, and I visited them all the time because he was married to my sister. And uh, so, but I had my own job and I wasn't, never thought of working with him, neither did he. I mean, I just got to know him very, very well. He, he was an incredibly brilliant, strong man, very intelligent, very logical. I couldn't even be on his same level. The only area where I was at the same level with him was classical music and table tennis. Yeah? But other than that, other than that, not, not a chance in hell. But I loved it. It's fine. Anyway, I went back to Europe then after two years in New York, got married, we had a baby. And then in 69, oh, I stayed always in touch with him, of course, visited in London. He asked me whether I would join him to go with him for one year to Romania. That was Ceausescu, Romania, deepest communist Ceausescu. Knowing how much he hated to travel <laughs> and to leave even, I mean, he hardly ever went to London, yeah? Uh, only for the dentist. Uh, <clears throat> you, you can see how strong his passion was to make this film. That's a very, very important thing, and I'm not joking. 
Yeah, that, that was necessary. He was a political beast. And you can see this topic in Pass of Glory, in Dr. Strangelove, in, even in 2001, right to the end. It was his one focus. It is the fact that we, as humans, are much more governed by our emotions than by anything else. Now, we may fancy ourselves to be governed by our intellect and knowledge and education and ay, ay, ay. that's all good for the job from nine to five, but it's not for our major decisions in life. And here is the interest in Dr. Strangelove. Here is the interest in Path of Glory and in Napoleon. And, and you know, he, he was fascinated by this brilliant man. I mean, he was brilliant. He had an enormous charisma, was colossally successful. Imagine a general of the French army at 24. And then a few years later, he crowned himself emperor of France, was adored by the whole population, was even loved by people outside of France. And then he blew it. He blew it. Because when, it really, when he was really tested, he failed on two accounts. He was unable to make peace with England. That should have been on his to-do list every day, first line. <laughs> and number two, when, when the Tsar broke the continental blockade, uh, which he was forced to, to uh, agree after he lost the war, he should have looked away. The Tsar had to do that. The Tsar needed the money. He had to sell his timbers and the stuff he, he, he could sell. Yeah? And uh, now, oh, no, ooh, 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 ooh. You know, now come the gorilla and, and revenge, revenge. And then came 1812, and it was the, uh, you know, the first Russian campaign, which was the beginning of the end. <laughs> Basta. And you know, this is what it, How could somebody so brilliant be also so stupid? And nothing has changed. Just look, <laughs> just look what happened last week in England. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is not the 17 million voters. It is a hard two dozen people who are demagogues who uh, ab abuse their position and mislead people. Look at the reaction of after, from America after 9/11. Self-inflicted damage, and the end isn't in sight. You know, so the, look at the Nazis. Oh, yeah, yeah, they exploded in midair and causing so much trouble and pain. So it is power alone is not enough. Statesmanship, wisdom, intelligence, and love is necessary combined. These are great statesmen, and goodness me, are they rare. Yeah, that, or stateswoman, by the way. I mean, the, the, the sex doesn't make any difference. So, uh, yeah, well, that, that, is, that is Stanley's main interest. And I really was, all, all, during all my working life, I observed this. I'm very much missing his running comment on what's going on right now in the world. Uh, yeah, it's really, I mean, it's really dismal. I mean, Eng England really is, is competing um, in, on the element of, of, of self-destruction with everybody else, but you still hold the Trump card. Yep, so, <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, I mean, let's see, let, let's see where we go, you know? Um, and uh, yeah, so that now, now after I have given you my little speech, now see all these things in this gallery and have this in mind. He was a serious man, a very serious man. The, the, the Dr. Strangelove is a serious film. He used the humor to underpin the seriousness, and he was incredibly self-critical, very, very careful. For example, he did a wonderful scene which, uh, where, oh, in the war room, they have a pie fight. They throw pies at each other. He took it out. He said, oh, no, 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 I, I went too far because humor is only good as long as it underpins and the, the seriousness. You've got to stick to this. This is a serious film all the time. And so, and look, look at it from this point of view. If you don't know Dr. Strange of well worth seeing, for him, the greatest achievement in his life was his last film, Eyes Wide Shut. Now, it's a very difficult film, I know, um, for reasons I mentioned before. And uh, uh, somebody calling me, I have to kill this. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ah, oh, Steven Spielberg. Hmm. <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, uh, I can't do this now. <laughs> so, now, uh, now, right, where was I? Right, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly, ter terribly distracted. Uh, <laughs> so, I beg your pardon? You just said Corbett, and you and I said you were saying that I five shot. 
Eyes Wide Shut. Right. So, right. Okay. So he, he really he really loved this film. Um, uh, I was very very pleased with it, and um, it, it is such an important film because, uh, as I said in the beginning, we, we all all know we really know what we are looking at. And I spoke to a gentleman before who mentioned Ingmar Bergman's film. Um, uh, what is it called again? It's an incredible film. Um, uh, about, about marital relationships, and that is much, much more serious. And and uh, Eyes Wide Shut in, in, uh, is in, in comparison to that like a Disney movie. And, but but I recommend it. If you have never seen it, see it. And if you have seen it and you didn't like it, you're wrong. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> go, 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 have, have another shot at it and, and realize how good it is. What's interesting for me is that this film was a huge success in Japan and in the Mediterranean belt. So but Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, great. Greece also and Japan. England, <laughs> America, <laughs> nothing. You know, a, a terrible result, bad reviews. Read. How come? I don't know. I don't know. I got an, 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 a fax from the Japan office of, of Warner Brothers, from the Tokyo office, saying it is amazing what this film does. Couples are leaving the cinema holding hands. Well, okay. Uh, in Japan, this is obviously a very big deal. I spoke to a man in Rome, an expert, uh, and I told him this. And he said, oh, it's clear to me. I said, what do you mean? It's, what, what, what? It has to do with Catholicism. What? The film has absolutely nothing to do with Catholicism. Ah, that may be so on the surface, but we are educated to deal with the topic of lust and sex and all the negative side of it and the abuse. You, Anglo-Saxons, you make dirty jokes about it. Well, not right. You know? So that is, that's what your problem. That's why you are defending yourself. You're defending yourself against eyes wide shut instead of embracing it and looking into a mirror and seeing yourself. I, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I really I can't comment further because I'm, I'm an amateur. Yeah? But it's interesting. So now another thing that might interest you is um, the film 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is really uh, was a big surprise and it came after Dr. Strangelove where Stanley goes doo, 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 doo. Yeah? Now here comes this film and Stanley takes a big bow to the unknowable, to the unknowable, very important. And uh, people over 40 really didn't like that film. The film was rescued by teenagers. Stanley got love letters from 14-year-old boys. You just wouldn't believe it. I mean, in particularly young boys loved that film. Incredible. So, and the film was a huge success. And um, while, for example, the Catholic Church condemned Stanley for Lolita, they immediately gave him a prize for 2001. Stanley was very, very surprised indeed. And after his death, we were invited by the Vatican in Rome to screen the film Inside the Vatican, they have a beautiful big cinema, 2001. I, oh, well, I mean, right, okay. I mean, one of us was very pleased. I mean, hey, that's a real stunt, right? So I, 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 also, I also went there and, and a beautiful, good screening room, fantastic, and this enormous, you know, maze of rooms. And, and uh, there was a cardinal. I, I, I think it was a cardinal because he had a red gown on. I think that's... Uh, I'm not an expert, you know, but, but he had a red gown on, very nice man, incredibly nice guy, spoke in Italian and then in English, and he said something i never forget. He addressed the audience and he said, you're going to see a film made by an agnostic who hit the bullseye. That's generous, right? That's really generous because, I mean, the film really is not a Catholic film. <laughs> I mean, it talks about evolution being part of the miracle of creation. Well, that very much goes against uh, Genesis 1, right? It didn't happen in seven days. But um, so, um, well, th there we are. I was very, very impressed. And, and I've, who, whoever has not seen um, the film uh, 2001, I can highly recommend it. And you see also some interesting images here, right? So now, um, I think I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I must, must make sure I, I stop because uh, oh, we've got only 20 minutes. Uh, how, can, how can I end this? I like, I like to end this by, by two important lines, and I, I repeat this very often also to film students. One 
line is important, and that is said by HAL. HAL, H-A-L, the computer that runs the mission in 2001. HAL says, foolproof, he talks about himself, foolproof and incapable of error. And we know the machine was already broken. Ah. That's what interests Stanley. <laughs> and, yeah, it's a bit hidden. It's a bit hidden, but many things are hidden. Um, for example, the end of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, a wonderful film that then Steven Spielberg made um, after being totally authorized by Stanley to do so, because he, Stanley gave him the film. Um, at the end of that, you see artificial intelligence, robots, in other words, discovering this huge find that was in the ice, a little early generation robot boy, and they are downloading his brain, everything he knows, simultaneously to all of them. They're just touching each other. No explanation about that scene, but we know there is no hierarchy. There is complete, I mean, there is exactly no jealousy between all these machines. And it is the jealousy and the hierarchy that's going to kill us. Uh, in eventually. Stanley was a real optimist in daily life and when it came to making films. You know, I mean, he was careful and very self-critical, but he was optimistic, very pessimistic about the destiny of humanity. The second sentence is a bit lighter, and I love that. And I associate the sentence with Stanley, and that is, goes like this. A man once loved a one-eyed woman so much that he thought all other women had one eye too many. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed the exhibition. <laughs> okay. And now we can do 10 minutes of question and answer. Oh. Great. Okay. Yeah. So I'm just curious, what is it like to get uh, phone calls from Stanley Kubrick? How demanding were those phone calls and how did you survive? <laughs> oh, I, I, I mean, I got about 50,000 of them. Oh. So. <laughs> Uh, no, he, 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 was, he was very factual. There was no, how are you today? You know, the, forget that. Yeah? But uh, uh, no, I, you know, you can't, I can't judge this because it's, it was no, he was normal. He was normal. The fact that he was demanding on himself was, uh, uh, was so necessary to also accept his demands on you. Right. Yeah? He, he, of course, he was not, yeah, it, it was just not a problem. I mean, to get his telephone calls. It was sometimes a problem for others when, when he called them and they didn't believe it was Stanley Kubrick and hung up. <laughs> that, <laughs> that happened quite a lot. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. So you had a question. Oh, just a, a simple one about Napoleon. Is there any footage available to actually We haven't started shooting. Now? Never started shooting? No, no. We made uh, tests with an Angenio 95 lens, a 0 0.95, which is not a great lens, but uh, uh, so test shots with, because we wanted the atmosphere of the time. But that was it. No, MGM pulled out and uh, they... Uh, pulled out, maybe for good reasons. And in, in a way, I'm grateful, because I think on the horizon we have a six-hour series, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for helping to make these movies a reality. I've seen all of these movies. Oh, I didn't really help to make this movie. If I had <laughs> somebody else would have helped him, I mean, I'm not that important. Yeah, what, what? I've seen all these movies dozens of times. 2001 is basically my Bible. Good. Oh. <laughs> Excellent. I want, my question for you, I wanted to ask, how do you think Kubrick would have felt about movie making today and in terms of like the kinds of movies that are made and CGI and technology? Every generation has brilliant filmmakers. And, and technology, he would have embraced. Mm, yeah. you know, no question in my mind. He would have adapted to technology and uh, no, no, that, that was fine. And you, know, you don't have to worry about the time. Every time has, every generation has great painters, great poets, great writers, great novelists, great filmmakers. There are always few. Ah, they, they don't come, you know, uh, as a mass-produced <laughs> mass produced item, but every generation has that, yeah. Spartacus. Spartacus? There's a, a, a shot that is a vast opening from high where every, all the marchers are coming in. Yes. Number one, how many people did that take? A couple okay. of thousand? Okay. And how long? That was a very long okay. scene. Number one, I wasn't involved. It was before my time, I was still at school. Number two, the background is a painting. It's called filmmaking. 
<laughs> you know, or as Martin Scorsese said so wonderful, you know, rear window wasn't shot on a rear window either. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a question? Um, what makes a great relationship between a producer and a director? To help him, to do what you're told, mm -hmm. and to succeed. I mean, okay, give you an example of where, things that are difficult. We needed for Full Metal Jacket three tanks from the Vietnam period. Mm. So, obviously, there were American tanks, but unfortunately, after Dr. Strangelove, these bridges were burned for good, right? <laughs> so, we, we, <laughs> I mean, as you can imagine, yeah? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, Stanley Kubrick for the U.S. Army was like, I mean, yeah, I don't know, uh, some, somebody very, a, 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 a Christian for Dracula, right? <laughs> so, anyway, so now, um, uh, so, okay, these tanks we had to find. And we found them in the Antwerp army. And I negotiated with a guy in Antwerp. I moved myself up to the right officer and told him what I needed. And he said, well, I mean, I remember him. He was a lovely man. He said, I mean, the Belgian army is very flexible, and we don't need these things either. But I mean, uh, you know, hiring our tanks is just not on our books. <laughs> so uh, well, anyway. Uh, I, I, I schmoozed a bit, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And finally, he said, just bring them back. <laughs> <laughs> so if you see Full Metal Jacket, you see three tanks. We squeezed them like lemons. I mean, yeah, they were always the same three tanks. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's filmmaking. We had one flying helicopter. One. The others are just cardboard and the thing which they just have just landed or were about to take off. But but yeah, but that's you know, how you make films, yeah. No, you can also talk to Catherine. She has lots of experience in, in Barry Lyndon, for example. If you look at the Barry Lyndon section, talk to her. She was a, a lo location per no, you, no, no, you, you were, yeah, location. So she has a lot of experiences like that. But this is an example. Or you need music. It, uh, that's what I, I, I did a lot, sort of, you know, uh, get, get, for example, this uh, Ninth Symphony in Clockwork Orange. It was in the book. You needed the Ninth Symphony to record the last bit where you have four soloists, a choir, and a big orchestra. Yeah. You can't do that yourself. It's, uh, it's just not affordable. Right. Yeah, you could, of course you can. It's in the public domain, the music. That's not a problem. Anybody can do it, but it's very, very expensive to get it right. Now, we had a real problem with the unions uh, uh, in, in, in England, but luckily, luckily, I found a recording that was mono out of the catalog of Deutsche Grammophon with uh, Ferenc Fritschai, who was long dead, and Berlin Philharmonic. But he couldn't care less, it was a mono mix. So it doesn't matter, yeah? So I got that for 3,000 marks a minute. That was a real steal. That was fantastic. <laughs> so th these are the things you do. Yes? Is there any possibility that the Aryan Papers Project may yet uh, see some kind of fulfillment? It would be great. We need, uh, you need a very courageous uh, studio. Uh, the, the, the Kubrick was all his life interested in uh, making a film about the Holocaust. And he had two big run-ups. And the last run-up was, was, I mean, you know, we worked for one year on, on this book, Wartime Lies, by Louis Begley, a great book, great book. And um, then I remember very well the day when Terry Semmel, who was the boss of uh, Warner Brothers, called and said, look, you realize that Stephen is doing a similar stuff in, in, in Krakow. Uh, called Schindler's List. We don't know really what it is about, but yeah. it has to do with the Holocaust and bad timing if you come then six months later. So Stanley uh, uh, postponed it and, and uh, put a, all his weight on preparation of AI, artificial intelligence. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, we were very few people. Catherine's husband was much involved in that at that time, I remember. And, and, but then, uh, <laughs> and then he, he offered this film to Steven Spielberg. I mean, yeah, you, could, you really you couldn't make that up, right? So um, that's what, what happened. And then he finally uh, decided to do, uh, yeah, uh, Traum novella, dream novel, Eyes Wide Shut, yeah. Uh, he, uh, I beg your pardon? The Aryan paper script is still it's all owned by Warner Brothers, they're sure. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't even a finished script. It was just a concept. He would have, the film would have been very different. There's no doubt about it from his concept. But it, it, it always was like that. I mean, the, when you read the f film script of, of, of any film of Stanley, and then you compare it with the 
end, uh, what really happened is huge differences. But, you know, that's okay. You know, it, it's not that extraordinary. I mean, painters have the freedom to, to change while they are painting, or writers, or, or composers. So why shouldn't a filmmaker? It's just a bit more costly. <laughs> no. uh, another question? Otherwise, I think... Last question. Last question? Yeah. Was Stanley ever overwhelmed? And, and if he was, did he ever overcome this? He was overwhelmed by the size of the universe. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I told this this morning somebody, when I observed Arthur C. Clarke and, and Stanley being so in love with what they want to do, I sensed it was being in love with their own insignificance. And uh, yeah, I, I, he was very much overwhelmed. But oh, by the way, I had a wonderful conversation with Arthur C. Clarke before he died about 14 years ago. And uh, he again uh, talked about 100 billion, uh, whatever, you know, in, in the universe of star, star. I, I can't deal with those numbers, right? And then I, I, I told him, well, it sounds to me like uh, there must be uh, celestial bodies in the universe like sand by the sea. And he looked at me and said, not enough sand. <laughs> okay? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. All right? Got it.